Hello everyone, welcome to my January wrap up of sorts. Um, this is not a, I don't know why I feel dizzy, it's weird. Whoa, 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 just feel a little lightheaded, I don't know what's going on. Anyway, I'm here to do my January wrap up now. As you can see from the title of this video, this is best and worst of January because at the end of the day, I am not going to be reviewing everything that I read in the month of January. That's why I started doing the weekly wrap ups because when it came down to doing a final wrap up for the month, I did not want to feel pressured to review all of the books that I read. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit of like stats, statistics and then after that I'm going to talk about my top and bottoms for January and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I will make sure that I leave the links to all of the applicable weekly wrap-ups for the month of January. I think the last one that I did is kind of a mix of January and February but I'll still link it because it does contain some titles that I did end up reading in January. The picture book log is done. I'm just waiting for an open window <laughs> to post it because my, my slots have been filled up and so I am waiting for that that moment to be able to go ahead and do my thing with it. But so you won't get full length reviews by the time this goes up you will not be getting full length reviews of the picture book she shed but that is coming soon. So we're going to talk like I said let's talk a little stats. This is interesting I'm actually keeping tracking this year. I don't really do tracking. I've complained about keeping track of stats and stuff like that but I thought that it might be a little interesting to see some things that I am accomplishing this year. So first things first let's talk about the number of books that I ended up reading this past month. I read 76 books but also keep in mind that I'm reading a lot of picture books and, and children's lit and once again not diminishing but it does make that number go up very very quickly when you are documenting everything and I have said this time and time again that it looks obnoxious but it really is just because of the tracking of the picture books that's why that number is elevated. I ended up reading 12,400 or the total amount of pages for the month was 12,468. For the audiobooks I listened to 6 days 13 hours and 43 minutes worth of audiobooks. That's not super accurate and the reason why I say that's not super accurate is because I'm not listening to books at 1.0 speed so I don't know what the math would be on that. I don't, I don't, I have no idea to be honest with you. I, I'm not a math person. So if anybody wants to figure that out, that's perfectly fine, <laughs> but I, I know that I can't do that. Um, the average number of pages that I read for each day in the month of January was about 336 pages. So I was doing, it was, it was a lot, my friends. It was, it was a lot. <laughs> it was doing a lot. All right, so let's talk fiction versus nonfiction. I ended up reading three nonfiction books and 73 fiction books. So we are looking at a heavy shift <laughs> in the difference there. It's going to change up in February because I'm reading a lot more nonfiction in February, but that's 3.9% nonfiction and 96.1% fiction, which whatever. In terms of formats, I read or listened to read whatever, whatever terminology makes you feel comfortable. It's all the same to me. I don't really care either way. <laughs> Um, I listened to 18 audiobooks which is 23.7% of the formats that I read. I read 10 digital which is 13.2% and then 48 were in print which is 63.2%. That's always going to be elevated I think because of the picture books but I have been reading a lot more physically than I have in the past just because I want my eyes to get used to reading again. That's just a personal preference for me. I'm not, I have a lot of different stats, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through every single stat, y'all. I can't, it will be, this will be excessively long. In terms of audience, I do want to talk about that. I read eight middle grade books and that was 10.5% of my total. I read 10 young adult books which is 13.2% of my total. I read 19 adult books, shocker, 
<laughs> which was 25% um, percent of what I read. And then of course, a whopping 39 children's books, which is 51.3% of my reading for January. In terms of form, so this is breaking down like whether I read a picture book, whether I, it was comics, whether it was a graphic novel, all that stuff. So I ended up reading 27 books that I considered to be prose, which was 35.5%. I read three novellas, which is 3.9%. I only read two comics, which is mind boggling to me, uh, which is 2.6%. I ended up reading one um, memoir, which was 1.3%, three manga, which is 3.9%, seven graphic novels, which was 9.2%, and a whopping 33 pictures for 43.4 percent so almost half of my reading for the month of January was picture books which is why I said like tracking that stuff it really does like it really does make your numbers a bit skewed and obnoxious now let's talk a little bit about um, different genres now I didn't go into heavy heavy specific with some of these genres but you know like I try to do the best I can in terms of like literary fiction, contemporary, realistic fiction, all of that is going to be house and general fiction. And so I ended up reading 31 of those, which was 40.8% of my reading. I read two sci-fi, which is 2.6%, 18 fantasy. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> I don't ever read that much fantasy, <laughs> which is 23.7%. Um, eight romances, which is 10.5%. Um, three that I consider to be kind of like historical, uh, so 3.9%, um, two mystery for 2.6%, uh, general nonfiction, which was the two nonfiction titles that I read, which is 2.6%, two memoirs slash biographies, so 2.6%, two thrillers for 2.6%, and three romantices, 3.9%. Shocker. Shocker, which romanticy really could go into fantasy, but for some reason I wanted to pull that out. I also looked a little bit at like where the nation of origin, like where my books were coming from in terms of translated works. So, and then also works that just are not from the US. I primarily read from the US this month. Um, 70 titles were coming from the US, that's 92.1%. I had one title from the UK, which is 1.3, four titles from Japan, which is 5.3%, and then one from Korea, which is 1.3%. Um, and the ones from Japan and Korea were translated. Um, in terms of like author, artist, gender, I primarily have been reading a lot of female authors. 69.6% of my books were by female authors slash artists. It's 55. It's a lot. Um, one by a non-binary author and artist, 1.3%. Two by other, 2.5%. And um, 21 by male author slash artist. Now, the reason why those numbers are not going to equal up to the amount that I read is because for some of the picture books, I had to do male and female because of the fact that there are two people working on the same book and they both need to be credited. So you may see kind of like an awkward number there, which, you know, hey, it is what it is. 34 books written by BIPOC authors or artists and 42 written by white authors so we're a little uneven there we have 55.3 percent and then 44.7 percent a lot of that has to do with the children's materials because to be honest with you especially those beginner readers they're not super diverse and so I was expecting that number to be kind of a little off in terms of um, queer rep we had two authors and artists that were queer which is 2.6% and 74 that were not, so 97.4%. And then the other thing that I, which is different from the queer protagonist, I should say that. So I don't go hunting um, for someone's um, sexual orientation or gender. I, I just don't, unless it's just like they voice it themselves. I just 
that can get really, really messy. So the queer protagonist in the books is going to be different than the author because I just, if an author has put it out there, I was able to document that information. But with the books, we see that number jump up to 6.6% because it was easier to identify. And the last thing that I would like to showcase is um, Disability Rep. I'm looking to read more books with Disability Rep. So this month I read six books with Disability Rep, 7.9%, and then 70 books that did not have Disability Rep, and it's 92.1%. So yes, those are just some stats of the stuff that I ended up reading this month. I don't know what my, I guess I could have calculated what my average was for the month. Okay, so I had one book that was one star. I had one book that was two stars, 13 that were three stars, six that were three and a half, 47 that were four, um, one that was four and a half, and seven that were five stars. Now I know that like when I did my weekly wrap up, I was like, oh, my first star, my first five star read of the year. The reason why I said my first five star read of the year is because I was not taking into account picture books for that. So that number is skewed heavily towards picture books and I just had found my first five star of the year. Okay, so now we are going to jump into the worst and the best. I have decided that because I have such an extensive li list of books to go through, I'm going to do a bottom two and a top two because I just think that it helps me narrow down because I had so many books that were really good reads, but I picked the books that stood out to me the most, both in the worst category and also the best category. So we're gonna start with the worst books because I always like to end these videos on a positive note. All right, so book number one for the worst books, Go Ask Alice by Anonymous, AKA Beatrice Sparks. I ranted and raved about this book, both on Goodreads and on one of my weekly wrap ups. This is part of the, um, I guess, why a rewind series that I'm doing, which also I need to find a slot for that video to go up. It's nice having content and trying to find slots. I must say it is nice, but it's horrible, y'all. It, it's a cautionary tale if you don't know anything about Go Ask Alice. It is a young girl who ends up um, trying marijuana for the first time. Then when she goes to a party, her drink gets laced with LSD and things just kind of go downhill from there. We're talking uh, excessive drug use and prostitution and just homelessness. It, it's a, it was a cautionary tale published in the 1970s to encourage kids not to do drugs. But when I tell you it was the most chaotic, unstable, horrible book that I've ever read. I have not read a book that horrible in a very, very long time. I think that there are ways to have conversations about drug use. I was talking about heroin by Minnie McGinnis. I mean, always talking about heroin by Minnie McGinnis. And this just was not the way to kind of showcase those conversations. I think that when the main character ends up in a psychiatric facility, the way that she refers to the other people is just kind of, it's cringeworthy, super, super, super cringeworthy. And then the parents, it's the parental lack of guidance here where Beatrice sets up this narrative like, if you start drugs, no one can help you. You're doomed. And it's like, yeah, you know, this is just not the way to have this conversation. I, I ultimately, it took me months to read a, I think that book was like 150 pages, no lie. It took me from September of last year until last month to finish that book. It would have never in a million years taken me that long to read a book that short. But it took me that long to finish the book because I just could not for the life of me get past the chaos and the foolery and the writing really wasn't good and it's written in like diary entry format and it just got weird it got super super weird and the ending of it was just horrible it i if i could i would erase that book from my memory and unfortunately i cannot because i can't the second one that i have on my list is midnight by amy mcculloch this is a middle grade author that switched to writing adult thrillers and I believe that this is her second adult thriller. This had all of the makings 
of like a perfect situation for a thriller mystery type of book. We have a main character who is dating this guy who's an art dealer. She does a lot of the financial things for him and he ends up contracting or working with an artist that is newly like discovered and not really he's still kind of low-key when the art dealer starts working with him he unfortunately passes away and then all of a sudden like his work just sells for millions now and so the art dealer coordinates this interesting trip because the the painter um dealt with like an Antarctica landscape so he coordinates this really exclusive luxurious cruise for them to go on and auction off pieces of his artwork and then of course he never makes it to the boat and so our main character essentially has to run all of this by herself but people just start dying on the boat this book was predictable it lacked efficient character development it was slow in the pacing it was extremely slow in the pacing so much that you don't really feel like much happens till you're 150 175 pages in which for a book that is just a little over 300 pages long that in itself is problematic it just was the i think the reason why i kept reading it is because of the fact that i made a prediction about what was going to happen 20 percent in i'm telling you you're going to know exactly how this story unfolds i made the prediction and i just wanted to see if i was right the upside to this and the reason why i gave this book two stars and not one is that the author is a world traveler and had spent time in antarctica had traveled to antarctica and did some beautiful like descriptions of antarctica and how dangerous beautiful and dangerous that type of like wilderness type setting like how it could be and i just wish that she would have taken more time to develop the characters in a plot like we get this great atmospheric feeling about the vastness of antarctica and how dangerous it essentially is to be in Antarctica. It makes you curious about Antarctica. But past that, the story itself to me just had no substance. You can't be boring and have a situation where people are on a cruise headed to Antarctica and there's nowhere to go on the boat and there's nowhere to go if you get off of the boat. That is the perfect situation for a very, very tense, um, high stakes situations and we don't get that we get a lot of lackluster slow paced undeveloped characters it just wasn't it wasn't what i was anticipating i was so excited when i originally heard about that book coming out when i read the synopsis of it i was like oh yeah this is gonna be good and it was not my friends it was not okay so diving into my top two books of the month these were the highest rated books that i read in the month of january one got 4.5 stars and the other got five stars for me and if you watch my last weekly wrap up you automatically know what my five star read is but the one that got 4.5 stars for me was most ardently by gabe cole novoa who is a new to me author but i am excited to check out everything that gabe has written because at this point it was so good. Most Ardently is a part of those classics remix line that they have going on and this one in particular was a Pride and Prejudice retelling with the main character being um, trans and he is the one that ends up falling in love with Darcy. So instead of Elizabeth, we have Oliver. And there are some pretty heavy content warnings on this, especially I would say in particular for like the naming, because a lot of Oliver's family members do not realize that he is trans. They don't know that he's trans. And so they use his dead name a lot. But this was so well written and it's it's such a big task to I think rewrite a Jane Austen novel to recapture that same magic is very very difficult especially with one of the most popular titles Pride and Prejudice like <laughs> I've seen like remixes or retellings of Pride and Prejudice that have not really gone as well as this one I think this is the first one that I've read where I have absolutely adored everything about it. I just thought full stop it was a very well-developed, well-written book. And 
we pretty much are following the same plot as Pride and Prejudice except Oliver is trans Darcy is this still this like shy kind of like I don't really do well with people like this is not great I love that we kept this uh, support of the father and the eldest sister like that was still a big part of it Charlotte is still a close friend and of course we still have Wickham who's a complete ass I mean as in the original work he is still the same in this work the only hiccup that I had with this one y'all is that I almost wish that Gabe would have deviated just a little bit because I wanted a little bit more with Oliver and Darcy I think that we could have gotten even more than what Jane Austen imagined in terms of romance and so or what Jane Austen would have been able to add that would be considered appropriate at that time and I'm not saying like add like the most scathingly <laughs> scathing like clutch of pearls content but I mean in the sense that I would have loved to see more time with them on page I would have loved to see more of the intricacies of their relationship and I would have loved to see their romance blossom more than what it was in that sense it almost stuck to the original a little too much and I feel like sometimes when you do retellings it's okay to deviate like I read what did I just read uh, saving or escaping not saving <laughs> absolutely not saving I just read escaping Mr. Rochester and that is a Jane Eyre retelling but it definitely deviates from the original source so I wish Gabe would have done that but in terms of writing character development the atmosphere of Jane Austen the same magic the love it it's all there and I loved it it was really good so that one got 4.5 stars and the one that I gave five stars to part of your world I had a complete and total breakdown almost on camera talking about this book because it's very reminiscent of some stuff that I'm dealing with now I'm not gonna have the same emotional reaction that I had then that was my first time talking about it and so it was getting all those emotions out it was actually my first time really talking about it and how it connected to me out loud and so that was very emotional for me to do that but part of your world by Abby Jimenez I was not anticipating liking this video not like this video liking this book can you tell I'm tired? I was not anticipating liking this book. It's gotten a lot of buzz everywhere and I just with uh, traditionally published romance it can always be a hit or miss for me especially traditionally published romance it's gotten a lot of traction. I always get a little nervous because I'm typically that one that just is not always a fan. This one also surprised me in the fact that I originally was not liking Alexis as a main character and it's Alexis and Daniel is told an alternating perspective she's a doctor I should, probably should have started with this just in case you haven't watched any of the weekly wrap-ups um, she's a doctor he um, does carpentry and he's in this small town that's really so small that it can be considered a village and he helps her with her car when she gets stranded on the side of the road they end up having one night's hand and their romance kind of builds from there but it is definitely more intricate than that and when I was reading this when I did one of the updates on one of my weekly wrap-ups I was like nah, I'm not really vibing with Alexis I really don't like her I'm not feeling her and then I kept reading and one of the things I came to realize when I reviewed this book is that Alexis definitely is me. It's that person that is has grown up in a in an environment where the acceptance or the how do I put this it's not necessarily ex the acceptance but the validation from your parents becomes make or break for you mentally and emotionally like you live your life for the approval of your parents not for your own happiness and satisfaction and Alexis is like that and she annoyed me because that is me and that is one thing about myself that I don't like I can feel myself in certain situations reacting or handling things a certain way because that's how you know they would want me to react it's not healthy it's exhausting it is mentally and emotionally abusive I think in a lot of ways and that's what happens in Alexa's situation this also has a lot of content warnings attached to it especially for um, manipulative manipulative and abusive uh, behavior on um, behalf of parents and a former partner 
and Alexis has to do a lot to break out of that cycle and to put herself first which is it hurts because you want to be happy you want to put yourself first but when you do that unfortunately there's this chance that you lose relationships with family because you have to draw that line or have that boundary of like I need you to respect me as an adult I'm not a child and I want to be able to live my life as an adult if I make mistakes those are my mistakes to make and not for you to constantly dictate which way which turns I should be living my life it becomes overbearing it is an overreach it is grossly inappropriate I think and I saw that with Alexis it was a moment where I got that book that I needed for the year I talked about this last week where or my literally my last video where every year I get that one book that comes to me when I need it the most. Last year it was We Deserve Monuments. It was about healing relationships, especially when someone is sick or um, has terminal illness. And at that time, my grandmother had been diagnosed with cancer. And that was a lot but I needed that book especially about like healing relationships and this time I'm getting this book that I need because I am losing relationships because of me wanting to kind of stand up for myself so I loved it I thought Dennis was not Dennis <laughs> Daniel I don't know why I call this man Dennis it's time for me to go to bed because I, I don't know why I call that man Dennis I love Daniel cinnamon roll hero love 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 how he treated Alexis gave her even when it was hurtful for him he gave her the space to figure things out because he couldn't force her to see what he had already seen and I I just loved him he was amazing he was he was very sweet just overall the book itself worked for me it created this like magic that I didn't know I would get out of this book this book had me bawling crying feeling all of the feels and I was not expecting Abby Jimenez to do that for me and it happened now I'm nervous like I want to read the rest of her backlist but I don't know if any of her other books are going to create the magic that I felt reading <laughs> this book five stars uh it still is at the time of when this video goes up it still is the only five star like outside of picture books and comics and graphic novels and all that stuff it still is the only like five star prose book that I've encountered yet. I don't know what that is. I don't know. I don't know. It could be because I'm reading so much and I'm very, I'm, I'm being very stingy with my high ratings. That could be it. Would not be surprised if that's a thing, but yes. Either way y'all, those are my stats for the month my worst and best books for the month let me know in the comments down below what was I guess like what is the best book you read in January what was the worst book you read in January as always if you like this video give it a thumbs up if you want to see more content from me click the subscribe button hit the bell for notifications and if you're looking for ways to support the channel via patreon amazon whatever follow me on social media all those links will be down in the description box below and I will be back with an video soon bye you're on the way Keep moving like the scars aren't even there It's in the air like a blazing